Welcome to this overview of the PlantLog O&M logging software. PlantLog was released in 2004 and is designed to help facility engineers maintain accurate and detailed records of their operations and maintenance activities. It is an internet-based service with no upfront costs and can be accessed through either a desktop web browser or a mobile app running on either a smartphone or a tablet. Let's start off by talking about the goal. Generally speaking, you would want to have the sort of things that you see here on the left migrated into the software. Most customers start off by using plant log for operator rounds. That is the routine inspection of equipment within the facility and their conditions to ensure that they are operating within normal parameters. Although the software is actually designed to be very flexible in nature and it can be used for many other purposes. These can, can include preventative maintenance, um, tracking check-in and check-out of various uh, items such as keys or pagers, and it can even be used as an inventory tracking system. So while you may start off doing operator rounds, uh, keep in mind that um, it could be used for different purposes, and that would really just depend on the type of facility you are and your particular needs. Here are the benefits of electronic logging using plant log over a traditional paper-based system or even a generic electronic system such as entering data into an Excel file. So the fast, first one is faster and simpler data input. And this may come off as counterintuitive to most because we naturally think that the fastest route is just to jot down some information on a sheet of paper. But in reality, the plant log software is desi designed to make data input as efficient as possible. So it can reduce the amount of time operators spend doing their rounds by as much as 70%. So faster data input equals less time spent with the operators doing their rounds, meaning they can go off and do other tasks with their time. The next benefit is more accurate and complete data. So there's many features in the software that ensures that the data that the operators are entering is accurate within the parameters an administrator has specified, as well as complete. So if an operator needs to go check a piece of equipment and you give him 10 items he needs to check, maybe pressure readings and temperature and, and other status readings, he must complete all 10 of those items. He might get distracted and accidentally walk away with a sheet of paper, maybe leave one or two of the boxes uh, incomplete. Uh, that would not be the case in the plant log software as it safeguards against those kind of human mistakes. The third benefit is immediate feedback from data input. And this is when readings are being taken on various pieces of equipment. Those readings may be a normal reading and, and to be expected, or they may be outside of normal thresholds, which could indicate a, a potential system failure. So the software will indicate to the operator when these conditions occur, and additional information can be provided to him so that he can take corrective measures right there on the spot. Um, so there's no delay in the amount of time that maybe a supervisor will review that information and then get back to the operator and at that point some time has passed and the condition could have worsened. So there's immediate feedback from data input. And finally, trending and analyzing historical data. And this is essentially reporting in the plant log software. And I like to call this really the icing on the cake because in the end it's all about reporting. If you're collecting data in a much more efficient way and that data is more accurate and more complete and your operators are getting feedback on that data, you now can take the data and trend it in ways that you can make intelligent decisions on that information. So it becomes more reliable information and you can depend upon it for doing true analysis. So these are the four main benefits that you should see in plant log and I will point the features out that lend themselves to these uh, benefits. Before we get started, let's look at the main components of the software. Number one is administration, and this is actually the initial setup of the software. Plant log does not come pre-configured for any type of facility or type of equipment. Uh, it is up to each of our customers to assign maybe a supervisor or a lead engineer to configure the rounds or other data collection that they want to do inside their facility. So this is really the upfront investment. It's actually very easy to set up and get started quickly, but there is an upfront investment. Essentially, you're converting your uh, round sheets that you have now or whatever, whatever else you're tracking uh, into the plant log software. 
So that would be the administration part, and that's always done through the desktop web browser. Number two is mobile data collection. So once the administrators have set up the software to some degree, then data collection can actually be performed. And this is done on either a smartphone or a tablet device. Uh, they can either run Apple's iOS platform or Android's um, Google's Android platform. So there's a free mobile app you can download, and the they work on either of those two, two platforms on any uh, you know modern day mobile device. Uh, you can view historical data on the mobile device, but only a subset of it. So, for example, an operator could potentially look at the previous readings that were taken on a temperature gauge that they're currently entering data for, or they could read uh, notes that were taken on that equipment from a few days earlier, but it really is only a subset. Uh, mobile devices are really meant for the data collection. Number three is data trending and reporting, and this is back to the desktop web application. So to go back is where, going back into the application is where you would view historical data that has been collected, most typically by a mobile device, uh, as well as running reports, uh, trending and analyzing, and things like that. All that's done in the desktop web browser. Um, one thing to note is that data collection can actually also take place in the desktop web browser. There are situations where you would want to do that, where it's more convenient to do it there than on a mobile device. Um, the only sort of restriction is that the equipment that you're collecting data on must not be configured to mandate barcode scanning because barcode scanning can only be done from a mobile device. So these are the three main components of the software. Okay, here are the three main features in plant log. The first one is logs that you see represented here with these clipboards. And logs are used to collect data on the various assets and areas within your facility. So this is where you would collect structured data. The next one is journals that you see here with a three ring binder. And this is used for recording various events that take place in the facility. So think about maybe a shift turnover log that you may have now. Journals would be what you would use in plant log to represent those. You're recording events that may have happened in the past and that you want to document. And finally, we have reports. And reports, obviously, is where you're going to view data that's collected from either the logs or the journals feature. So this is where you can trend data that may have been collected in your logs, maybe during your rounds. And also for your journals, you might want to pull out critical journal records that uh, indicate a potential problem uh, and so on. So these are the three main features. And let's talk about them in turn now. So the first feature is logs, and like I said, this is where you will, you will use a log to schedule and execute data collection, most typically on the assets within your facility. And given that logs is a fairly uh, robust feature, there are other concepts we're going to discuss that all are related to how to set up a log. The first concept is groups, and these are just blue folders, and think of them as just like folders on your computer. You may have one folder that contains photos, another one that contains music, and so on. Setting up groups in your in this plant log software is really just laying out a blueprint, uh, a high-level organization on where you're going to put your data. So you can break up groups into maybe a geographical manner, where you would have a group to represent the main building at the facility, maybe another one for the basement and the second floor, and so on. And then you, or you could break it up in a functional manner where you would have a group called chillers and all the equipment related to your chiller system would be inside of that group. And of course you can mix the two as well. So you could have a top level group called chiller or main building and then inside you could have further groups for further organizations that would list out the functional areas within the main building. And so this is just a, a way to organize large amounts of information. Inside of the groups, you will have the actual log. So this is the main concept for the feature. And you would use a log, at least to begin with, you would use logs to represent the equipment that you're collecting data on. Um, so for example, if you have a chiller, you may have multiple chillers, most likely you would set up one log per chiller so that all the data that you're collecting on that particular chiller will be stored in that one log. So that's one way to approach it. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. You could potentially store 
data for multiple pieces of equipment in a single log, if you like, if it makes sense for you or your operations. So once you create a log and you've defined the equipment that's going to, where the data is going to be tracked, you now need to create at least one activity. So if you think of a paper-based system, you might have a clipboard with a sheet of paper attached to it, and it's that sheet of paper that where data is going to be filled into. It's the same concept here. An activity is the sheet of paper or the form where data is going to be entered into. And you will create one activity per event that's going to take place on that equipment. So if you're, we're talking about a chiller here, you might want to do a daily round on that piece of equipment once a day. So you can create an activity and name it daily round. And that is where all the data collected uh, during the daily round will be performed under. And because activities are mostly time-based and they're done on certain time intervals, you can also apply a schedule to an activity. And that would be indicated here with the yellow bell. And you can set up a schedule to either be based at a specific time. So let's say you want to perform the daily round starting at 8 a.m. every morning. Or it could be on a rolling schedule where the, the due date for this particular round would be due eight hours from the last time it was done. So let's say it was done at 10.30 a.m. this morning. It would then be due exactly eight hours from that time. And then whenever it was due next, it would be due another eight hours from that time. So that's what we call a rolling schedule. So these are your two options. And the idea here is that you do want to specify what needs to get done, but you also should specify when it needs to get done so that you can track that people are getting the rounds done on the times that you specify. And then once you set up your activities, at least one per log, then you can set up what we call items. And items is just a generic name for whatever readings or tasks you want to have performed during that activity. So if you create an activity called daily round, you might have these four readings that you want to have recorded during the daily round. It might be a pressure reading. You might want to have them record a, the hour meter on that machine, maybe the mode that machine is on or its power status and so on. So this is what we call items and items get assigned to the activities. You may do different things on the equipment at different points in time and the items that get done during those activities may or may not be shared. So you may have a totally different set of readings that need to get done during the daily round and then maybe a different set of readings that get done or tasks that need to get done during the monthly PM. So those are items and these are the actual data points that will be collected. Now when it comes to these items or data points, you can also specify the normal boundaries for each of those items. So as an example, this pressure reading here, this pressure gauge, that you can see the needle in the red area. That indicates what we call an exception because it's outside of the green area and it is considered to be abnormal. So during the administration setup of the software, you can specify the normal ranges for all of your numeric readings and you can also indicate what status readings or selection type readings are considered abnormal given, given the item that you're collecting it on. So basically you're specifying what is normal and what is abnormal so that operators can get that immediate feedback on when, it, when the equipment is outside of uh, normal operating boundaries. So that's what we call an exception. And exceptions are treated very differently in the software. It's the only time you will see something in red. The color red is always reserved for exceptions. So when you view historical data, if it shows up in red, it's indicating to you that that data is outside of what the administrators have specified as normal. And then finally, here's the overview of the concepts we just talked about. So we have groups and inside of these groups, this is where you're going to lay out uh, your facility. Inside of those, you will have your logs. These will generally represent the equipment that you're tracking. And then inside of each log, you will have at least one or several activities that are performed on that log or equipment. And then finally, the items that are assigned to the activity. So these are the actual data points. So these items here can be assigned to maybe just one of these activities or even multiple activities. So maybe this pressure reading you might want to have done, say, during the daily round, but you also want to have it tracked during the weekly inspection, maybe a more thorough inspection that you do. So you can choose when these readings ne need to get uh, collected upon. So those are the main concepts behind the logs feature.
And real quick, let's look at how that all comes together in the actual web application. So here is the logs workflow page. This is the administration setup of the logs feature. And on the left hand side, we have those groups we've talked about. And if we open up one of the groups, let's say the top one called chillers, you will find a log that represents all the chiller equipment in this facility. And likewise, if we go down to electrical, we open that up. And of course, there's the electrical equipment. And let's just look at one of these logs real quick. We'll look at chiller number one. Here's that log up here. And then over here on the right is the full list of all the readings, all the items that are taken on this piece of equipment. And if we open up this log, we will see the activities assigned to it. So there are several activities for chiller number one, the first one being daily round. So if we select that one, the list of items here on the right will change and it will only show the items assigned that need to get done during the daily round. And if we click on the monthly PM activity, you'll see that, that there are only a few items that need to get done during this activity. And these, these may be shared with the daily round activity or they might be exclusive to this particular activity. And if we look up here to item number three at the top, you can see it has an optimal range and that is where you specify the normal numeric value for this reading. Anything below or above this range is considered an exception. And likewise, item number 29 here is recording an oil leakage and you could see that the options here, that the full option is shown in red. So that's designated as an exception, whereas the one half, one quarter and empty are all in black which deems that they are normal conditions. So this is the logs feature in the actual web application. Okay, so now let's look at how data is collected for logs in the mobile app. When an operator signs into the app using either a smartphone or a tablet, the first thing they'll see is this screen. And if you notice, these lists of groups here are identical to the ones we just saw in the administration portion. So we have the chillers group at the top and then electrical and so on. What's different though about this is that you'll see some yellow bells sitting on top of these blue groups, these folders. And what this is doing is indicating to the operator which readings or which activities need to get checked as of right now, as of this very moment. So if you remember, we can set up schedules for activities as an administrator to dictate how often these rounds or inspections need to get done. But in the mobile app, the bells will appear when that schedule actually becomes due. So the first thing an operator can do is come down here to the lower right. This blue button is a filter button, and they can filter out all of the groups or areas that do not have activities that need to get done. In other words, they can filter down to only see the groups with bells, and hence the logs and activities within, within them that actually have rounds or inspections that need to get done at that very moment. So that is the overview screen here. Now, operators do not need to go browsing through any of these groups to find the equipment in order to put in data because you can simply they can simply come down here to this orange button which will activate the barcode scanner and they can simply scan the barcode uh, related to that equipment. And that is explained here. So barcoding is one of those features that helps improve data input. It, it helps reduce the time it takes to do data collection. So each log that you create as an administrator, you can assign a barcode tag to. And so operators can simply walk around the facility and scan these barcodes and it'll take them directly to that equipment. So this is one of the, the features that lends themselves to that, to that benefit. And so you got increased speed of data input you have increased accuracy because you may have several pieces of equipment that are basically identical to each other and that might be right next to each other. In a paper-based system, it's quite easy for a person to fill out a form for say chiller number two when they were actually in front of chiller number one. They just didn't notice the little number listed at the top. So barcoding removes those sort of errors. And finally, you have some level of accountability. So this is to ensure that data being collected on a piece of equipment within the facility was actually performed in front of that equipment. So that's barcode scanning. When the operators input data on the mobile device, if the data they put in is considered an exception, they will get an audible alert and a visual uh, warning dialogue that they will need to confirm. So it will tell them that the value they entered is considered an exception and it'll also show them how far out of the normal range it really is. So um, 
that, that gives them some help on what they could, what actions they might be able to take uh, to correct that problem. And that these are these additional instructions that they can read and then they can take those follow-up actions. So that's exception data. The data input process, this is another way that data input is reduced, the amount of time it takes to do so. So the plant log app is designed in a way to streamline data input. Every time they put in a value, they can hit a down arrow and be taken straight to the next reading that they need to input. Every value that they put in will be indicated by either a green check mark, meaning that it's a good value, or a red explanation point, meaning it was an exception. And if they ever have to skip an item for some reason, there is the occasion where they have to skip an item. Let's just say that a gauge, a pressure gauge that they need to take a reading from is perhaps broken or the needle is jammed on that gauge, they can skip over or set that item to inactive. But it's an explicit thing that they have to do. They cannot accidentally skip over an item and forget about it. The software will prevent against uh, that sort of mistake. And then uh, finally, after they put in all the required readings or the tasks that they need to do for that particular activity, in the end, they could always add in an optional note. Maybe they notice an oil leak or the machine is making a funny vibration sound, uh, something to that effect. Um, they can also review previous notes for the machine. So they might want to look at the previous notes to see if the, the machine, uh, what the condition was a few days prior. And if the condition a few days earlier from a note is the same as it is now, rather than retyping in the note, they can copy the previous notes into the current note. And again, that's another feature that improves data input. So people aren't typing the same things over and over. So that's basically data input for the logs feature. Okay, moving on to the journals feature. So like we mentioned before, journals is different than logs in that it doesn't, it's not designed to collect structured data, data that you know you want to collect at a certain time interval. Instead, it's used for primarily communications between the operators in the facility, and they can use it to document various events that have taken place. So a common example for a journal is a shift turnover log. Uh, you might now have a log book there in the control room where operators will come in, they will fill out um, certain situations that took place. Maybe there was uh, a machine shut down or they want to record when visitors come on and off site, things like that. Uh, basically things that you do not exactly know when they will happen or what will actually be the nature of them. So every journal record has these three components assigned to them. The first is the date and the time of occurrence. So when it comes back, when going back to the logs for a moment, when a log record is recorded, the moment that the operator hits the save button, the software will automatically track the date and the time that they completed it. This is different in journals because when it comes to journals, you're usually recording uh, information that took place in the past. So we allow operators to change the date and the time to reflect when the event actually occurred, which is probably more important than when the operator is actually recording or documenting what took place. So the first part of the, the journal record is the date and time. The next one is a category and administrators can create a global list of categories and for each journal that they create, they can dictate which categories belong to that journal. And journal categories can be either normal status, like say a, a category called general. So anytime operators make a general journal entry, they can choose that category but they can also be of an exception type, meaning that they are somehow critical in nature. And they, just like log records and the items for log records, they will show up in red and they will be treated differently in the software. So you can choose when an entry is considered normal or abnormal. And then finally, the last piece of the journal record is the actual text entry. And this is where the operator can enter in a description of what took place who was on site, and so on. Um, this can be done either from the web application or from the mobile app. So real briefly, here is how an administrator would configure journals in plant log. We go into the journals workflow. He would create a journal representing each topic that they want to cover. 
this one I have highlighted is actually the shift turnover example that we spoke about. And then here on the right is the list of categories that are assigned to this journal. So anytime someone goes to make a journal record for this journal, they will have to choose one of these, the most appropriate category when they make their entry. Obviously the ones in black are considered normal and the ones shown in red are designated as exceptions. Now when operators want to input, review or input records in a journal, they can simply come to the journals tab here. And we are now looking at the shift turnover journal and all these entries will be listed in chronological order and they can simply add a new journal record up here. And this can also be done on the mobile device in the same fashion. Okay, now let's look at reports. Assuming you are now doing operator rounds using logs and that that data is more accurate and complete, as well as documenting events with journals, you can now view that all that information in the reporting section in a variety of ways. Here are some of the high level benefits in the reporting section. Plant log comes with 18 standard reports built in and we add new ones regularly. These reports are generic in nature and designed to benefit most any facility type. Second thing is you have the ability to memorize reports for quick reference. So this means that you can pull up any report, you can make various settings and filters in that report and then memorize it and give it a new name so that tomorrow you can come back to that same report and very quickly pull up that updated information without having to reconfigure the report to your liking. You can also schedule reports to automatically be delivered to recipients by email. So this is important because you might want to keep tabs on certain aspects of the facility, but you may forget to go into the plant log software every day. So instead you can have a report memorized and then scheduled to be delivered to, to, send, to be sent to you at a given time interval, maybe say every 24 hours. And then finally, when the built-in standard plant log reports do not somehow suit your needs, plant log, we can also do custom report development. And these reports can be tailored to your exact needs. They can be themed to be themed for your company uh, and they can do any kind of calculations that you require. So custom reports can be added right alongside the standard reports uh, to be very specific in nature. Here's a few screenshots of some sample reports that are some of the standards. So this one is a numeric comparison and you're really just taking numerical items, adding them to the list in that report and then selecting a time period. And then the report will show you the highest value taken for that for, or well, the last value taken for that reading, the lowest value taken in the time period you selected, the highest value taken, and then the average. So this is a very basic, analytical report when it comes to numeric items. Here's a numerical trend report, and this is good for trending maybe one or multiple numeric items on a line chart. There are several graphical charts included. And then finally here is what we call the exception report, and this is perhaps the most popular. This one will show you all the exceptional data that came out of say a single log or a group of logs within a given time period that you specify. So let's just say you are the shift supervisor. You might want to run this report at the end of every shift and you can review all the exceptional data that took place during your shift. Quickly, let's look at the reporting page here in the plant log web application. Over here on the left is a list of all of the reports. As you can see right here. We can run a report real quick. This is the latest log record report. So let's just run that for the chillers group and select all the logs in the chillers group. And this report will show you the latest record taken for every log within the group that you selected. No matter when it was taken, it will show you the latest record along with the values. So here are the list of the reports. If we want to look at the memorized reports, we simply select memorize and it'll show you all the memorized reports. These two at the bottom have the blue bookmark that these have been memorized and then we can also come down here and look at scheduled and you can see this one report that's also that's memorized but also scheduled with that yellow bell and this one will ge be generated automatically on the time interval you specify and delivered to the recipients you choose uh, by email. Congratulations for getting this far into the video. 
As a bonus, I'll discuss one more feature we call labels. Now labels are completely optional. You don't have to use them at all to use the other features in the software. But if you do choose to use them, they give you the ability to further categorize and add more potentially more functionality to the logs and the journals and, and other areas that you're collecting data upon. So a label is essentially something that you can create and assign to the other objects we already spoke about, such as logs, groups, activities, journals, and even users. So depending on your needs, you can create different labels um, that will store additional data. This is often referred to as metadata. So the main components of a label are listed here. The first one is a label name. It's simply the name you're going to give the label and which you're going to track information about. Second is a color code. So given that you may be creating several labels, there might be more than one label that are related to one another. And so you can use color codes to sort of um, correlate their relationship between each other. And then finally, there's the value type. And a value type for a label is the data that's going to be assigned to that label when you assign it to an object, such as a log or an activity and so on. So let's talk about the value types. The first value type that you can have is we call none. And that is when the, val the name of the label itself is sufficient enough. So the example we have here is fire and safety. Let's just say that you have a bunch of logs in your administration setup and they track fire extinguishers and perhaps eyewashes. You can create a label called fire and safety. And when you create those logs in the administration section, you can assign this label to, those, to that equipment. And that way you now know what equipment is related to fire and safety and it potentially can let you run a report that strictly focuses on your fire and safety equipment as opposed to your normal operational gear. So that has, so this is a label with basically no value type. The second value type is numeric, and this is when you will assign a label to an object, and then you will be forced to put in a numeric value. So the example we have here is fuel capacity. Let's just say you're tracking generators in plant log as logs. You can assign the fuel capacity label that you create, and when you do so, you can enter in the amount of fuel that each generator can hold in gallons or liters or whatever. Um, so that is the numeric value. A text value is when you say whatever, when you do assign this label, you're going to be putting in an alphanumeric uh, sequence of characters. So for example, a serial number is a good example because despite their name, most serial numbers have letters in them as well. So if you wanted to track the serial numbers of your equipment, you could create a label called serial number or model number and when you assign it to the equipment you will actually enter in uh, that value for that equipment. Again you can go back to reports and run a report and you can search your equipment by serial number or model number. The next value type is called date and this is when you want to apply an actual date either in the future or in the past um, to a given piece of equipment. Uh, the example here is a decommission date. So say you have equipment that you need to monitor, but in five years, every five years, you need to retire that equipment and replace it completely. So if that were the case, you could, you could set up this label and put the date five years in the future as soon as you um, activate that equipment. So you can run reports that will actually tell you when the decommission dates are approaching for that equipment. Next, we have a value type of selection, and this is where you can create a long list of different choices, selections, and then when you assign this label to an object, you will be forced to select one of those options that you've created. So example here would be a manufacturer. If you wanted to categorize all the equipment you're tracking in plant log by manufacturer, you can create this label and then list all the manufacturers of your equipment. And finally, we have a value type of URL. And a URL is simply an internet address. If you use this label, this has kind of special functionality built in because if you use this label, you can provide an internet address to either a web page or a PDF document. And so let's say you want your operators to have the ability to reference 
um, the user manual of a given piece of equipment while they're doing their rounds. You could potentially create a label called documentation and then apply the URL to that PDF document for that equipment. And when you do so, operators in the field can look at this label and then actually click on it and the software will navigate them to that PDF document so they can view schematics and other procedures and so on. So that is how labels works and um, it can be used for a variety of reasons. It really just depends on your options and, and the ideas you come up with. But it's another layer of information that you can apply to the plant log software. And finally, here's what labels look like in the web application. This is the manage labels page. So this is where the administrators will create the labels. We have the list of labels here, their names, their color code, followed by their value type. And if they happen to be a selection value, then the list of selections that are possible when they're being assigned. And then if we come over here to the logs workflow that we saw earlier, if we go under say the group called safety equipment, we can then go under say fire extinguishers and then here's all the fire extinguishers in the facility. We can go into one of these logs, we can click the edit button, we can go under the labels tab and we can assign it the fire and safety label. And we could do that for all the equipment that's related to fire and safety. And we can also assign any other applicable labels here at this, this area. Okay, that's it for this tutorial. Be sure to watch other videos in this series which cover different aspects of the plant log software.